Is there a greater meaning behind this mask seen in the Halloween display in the background of the pharmacy in Halloween 4? Maybe. Just maybe. Last time on Things You Missed, we talked about the strange subversive secrets that may change the way you look at Halloween 3. That movie, as unique as it may be, was not well received. It was the lowest grossing Halloween movie, and it did even worse with critics. For those in charge of the IP, it was time to go into damage control. The idea of making each movie a unique standalone story set on Halloween was abandoned in favor of resurrecting Michael Myers. But while the producers wanted to forget about Season of the Witch, the artists behind Halloween 4 may have felt a little bit differently. Take the school scene for example. Now this may be a total coincidence, but there are three doors with Halloween decorations in this set, and they are the big Halloween 3, Skeleton, Witch, and jack o we don't see the masks themselves, but we do, curiously, see this exact combination of Halloween avatars later on at one of the houses that Jamie Trick or Treats at. That brings me to this mask, which may look a little bit familiar if you've seen Halloween 3. It almost seems to be a zombie-like version of the villainous mask maker Connell Cochran. There may be another mask that references Halloween 3, seen right here. You may remember one of the symptoms of the microchip being distributed in the Silver Shamrock mask was for bugs and snakes to pour out of the children's skulls. Of course, most of what we see in Halloween 4 is designed to make us think more about the initial two movies, Halloween and Halloween 2. To learn how the kills in this movie were inspired from Michael Myers' past, stick around to the end of this video. When writing Halloween 2, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill made sure that Michael did not survive because they felt they had creatively exhausted the character and wanted to open the door to other Halloween stories. But like their protagonist, Sam Loomis, even they could not kill Michael Myers. Welcome to Things You Missed. In this episode, we cover the return of Michael Myers. Literally, that's the name of the movie. Once again, I am joined by a guy I found on the street who claims to have seen a couple of Halloween movies, Jimmy Champagne. Halloween sure is a funny way to say Scream 3. Over the years, there have been a number of soft reboots, like Halloween H2O 20 years later, and what I sometimes call Halloween H4O. Looking back on Return, I'm tempted to start calling it Halloween H1O. Releasing and taking place 10 years after the original, it tells a story very similar to the initial Haddonfield murders, but still technically more of a sequel than a remake, setting the standard for decade anniversaries going forward. In fact, on this 10th anniversary, the Michael Myers character would be 31 years old. 1031 is Halloween. As a soft reboot, there are a lot of parallels to Halloween 1978, some of which were situated very creatively. Let's get in to the things you missed. I've only seen that movie about a thousand times. How could I not have noticed that? <laughs> We begin on a rainy night with a patient transfer, not unlike the opening of the first movie. I do not know why they always choose the day before Halloween to move him, it never works out well for them. I imagine after 10 years of being an invalid, the idea of Michael Myers as an actual threat kind of faded into legend, and the transfer personnel let their guard down. How many bodies did you find? It's hard to tell, they're all chewed up. What, so you can't count them? They also subtly let us know that Laurie Strode, the final girl from the past two movies, was killed off screen by simply mentioning that Michael only has one living relative, his niece Jamie. Yeah, they kinda do Laurie dirty here. I think only Alex Browning could ever relate. They do kind of honor Laurie though by naming Jamie after the actress Jamie Lee Curtis, who of course played Laurie. Man, if you guys don't know that Jamie Lee Curtis played Laurie at this point in the series, you, there's no helping you. Jamie is supposed to be eight years old, meaning that Lori must have given birth to her pretty soon after escaping Michael Myers. She would have been no more than 19 when she had the baby. On the bright side, I guess she got over Ben Tramer pretty quick. The next time someone tries to tell you Halloween 2018 didn't need to happen, remind them that it brought Ben Tramer back to life. When we're first introduced to Jamie, she's in her room, having scary visions of Michael coming after her. Only, we see Michael before she does, which doesn't really make sense. If we as the audience are seeing her visions, we should only be able to see the things that she sees. That's not why I brought this scene up though. On Jamie's door, I noticed what I assume are some of her drawings, such as this rendering of a princess named Jessica and a picture of a clown named Clowny. Never be creative again. This is a major clue about the lineage of evil in her family. You'll recall that the opening of Halloween featured the six-year-old Michael Myers wearing a clown costume and stabbing his own sister. I get what they were going for, but I'm just gonna say it, that was a lazy Easter egg. Agreed. This clown drawing, her disturbing visions, and the fact that she chooses a clown costume for trick-or-treating are all clues that she is doomed to the same fate. She ultimately stabs her stepmother at the end of the movie and stands idly in the same pose that her uncle took 25 years prior. 
In each Halloween installment, I've discussed what I see as the main theme of each film, what the director was really trying to say. For Halloween 1, I talked about how early exposure to adult concepts can shape a child's mind for the worse. In addition to that, while it wasn't the main point of that video, I also talked about the idea that Michael Myers represents the personification of fate, as discussed in Laurie's English class. That's right, Samuel's definitely personified fate. In Samuel's writing, fate is immovable, like a mountain. It stands where man passes away. Fate never changes. I think the concept of fate really comes front and center in Halloween 4. Haddonfield was traumatized by the murders in 1978. Everyone in town who's old enough remembers it, and is willing to do just about anything to prevent it from happening again. Even the new sheriff, Meeker, who has stated to never overreact about anything, shuts down the town and imposes a curfew before even having any proof that the big, slow-walking man is back again. Mr. and Mrs. Carruthers have a million emergency numbers on their fridge, and the men at the bar are willing to take matters into their own hands to protect the town from another disaster. But despite all of this, the night plays out almost exactly like it did 10 years prior. Annie and Lori were hired to babysit Lindsay and Tommy back in 78, and now it's Rachel Carruthers being forced to watch her adoptive sister Jamie in 1988. Annie plans to bring over her boyfriend Paul. In Rachel's case, she makes late night plans with a boy named Brady. Basically, they really played it safe for Michael's big return after Halloween 3 season of The Witch didn't light the box office on fire. There's enough new stuff on the surface, but at its core, it's a very similar movie to Halloween, but just set 10 years later. And obviously, I think that's exactly what brought people back to the theater. In the original, Michael gets a suit from a mechanic that he took out on the side of the road. This time, he visits an auto shop and basically recreates his wardrobe. Jamie is bullied by the kids at her school in almost the exact manner that Tommy Doyle was. Boogeyman! Ooh, the boogeyman! The boogeyman! The boogeyman! The boogeyman! 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 While these details are probably just evidence that some things never change, it is the kills in Halloween 4 that really cement the idea that Michael Myers terrorizing Haddonfield is truly an inescapable fate. In the first Halloween, we saw Michael attempt to recreate the horror he had first created at age 6 using promiscuous teenage babysitters as stand-in victims for his sister Judith, even going so far as to arrange them under his sister's tombstone. Ten years after that, the kills now seem to be recreations of the night he came home. For example, after Michael arrives in Haddonfield, his first victim there is a dog in both the 1978 and 1988 versions. After Rachel and Jamie are gathered by the police, they take shelter in the sheriff's house. We only see the aftermath of Deputy Logan's death, but the sheriff's daughter, Kelly, is taken out next. She and Brady would fill the role of horny teens, just like Bob and Linda in the original. And on top of that, her death is kind of a combination of Linda and Bob's. Remember, Bob was pinned to the wall with a knife, and then Michael pretended to be Bob to get close to Linda. So this time things are slightly changed. Michael sits in a rocking chair pretending to be Deputy Logan and he uses his shotgun to impale Kelly and pin her into a door. Then Brady is strangled which happens to be the same fate Annie and Linda suffered in Halloween. Finally, there's a major parallel in the final chase. Rachel fills the role of Laurie Strode in this one, as a responsible babysitter trying to protect the kid that she's watching. We saw Laurie hide in a closet and use a coat hanger to poke out Michael's eye and temporarily blind him in Halloween 1. Then in Halloween 2, she shoots him in the eyes, or I guess just slightly above the eyes, but the drip down once again renders him unable to see. Or apparently use any kind of critical thinking at all. Rachel, who is stated to have been babysat by Lori when she was younger, Your mother used to babysit me when I was your age. I bet you didn't know that. Apparently picked up a thing or two from her, because she saves the day at the school by blinding Michael with a fire extinguisher. Which leads to this hilarious interaction. In the school! There are other similarities to 1978 as well. For example, we see other teens dressed up as Michael Myers. Is that him? Is that him? Yes. What? What do you mean, yes? I mean, you'd think he'd be a little bit more apprehensive after the whole Ben Tramer incident where an innocent kid in a Michael mask ended up getting killed. Actually, history does kind of repeat itself here. Our good old Illinois boys are concerned when they hear about the curfew and decide to take matters into their own hands. And it turns out they shot someone named Ted Hollister. Poor Ted Hollister. We never even saw your face. <laughs> and now you're gone. Damn, man. 
Then, later that night, after murdering someone, they fire their guns in the air while driving past the police officers on their way into Haddonfield, where a serial killer is currently on the loose. I want to like these good old Illinois boys, but they're just not very smart. It's no wonder most of them get taken out by Michael. However, that does lead to Rachel getting control of their truck and ramming it into her masked stalker. And just like Halloween 1, there's that fake out moment where he appears to be dead, then rises up using the same sit up motion. Then at the end, when Michael is seemingly defeated for good, like at least for this movie, we see that Jamie still can't change her fate because the evil seems to be passed down to her. And we see her point of view as she puts on the clown mask and stabs her mother, a scene that Loomis recognized as being identical to Michael's attack on his sister. So while we don't have a long in-class lecture about fate this time around, the idea of immovable fate is the driving force behind the events of Halloween 4. We even have this overly religious reverend who Dr. Loomis catches a ride into Haddonfield with. I mean, he specifically says that you can't kill damnation because it doesn't die like a man does. And next, that the apocalypse always has a name and a face. Well, in this case, that name is Michael, and that face is William Shatner looking decidedly more surprised than he does in earlier installments in this franchise. There's also the dog named Sunday. Sunday. Sunday is the holy day in Christianity, and Michael is made out to be the spawn of hell. Even the security guard at the hospital seems to think so. Jesus ain't got nothing to do with this place. Welcome to hell. So it seems like the Reverend may be onto something with his apocalyptic provisions. Then again, that Reverend also says things like, I saw it clear as breasts and blue suede shoes. Do you have any idea what that means, Jimmy? No, I don't. Yeah, he's also DUI. That's a pretty serious crime, and it goes completely unaddressed. As does the fact that this diner is just filled with pictures of regular Abraham Lincoln. I want to take a closer look at the costumes of some of Jamie's classmates at the school. This kid in particular wears a getup from the 80s cartoon Mask, and it has a red truck with an explosion. It almost seems to be a reference to Michael Myers, who of course wears a mask and steals a red truck, which causes an explosion. I'm guessing that explosion is also why the phone lines are down later, and this image almost looks like a burning cross. Maybe a symbol for the Judgment Day mentioned by the Reverend. When Jamie is picking out her own costume, she browses through all of the other costumes worn by her classmates before settling on her clown suit. This essentially says that she cares more about doing her own thing than fitting in with the other classmates, which I think ties into the idea that I keep on talking about, that nothing can sway her from her own destiny. Interestingly, the kid who compliments her is the same kid who was bullying the shit out of her at school. So she kind of ends up fitting in just by being herself. Or, you know, the costume budget was really low. After picking out her costume, Jamie is scared by an encounter with Michael. There's actually a clue that he's going to be in there when they first pull up, and you see the big industrial hook on the truck across the street. If you pay close attention, you'll remember it from when Dr. Loomis explored the auto shop earlier in the movie. Also, the girl who drops Rachel and Jamie off at the drugstore is named Lindsay. I'm pretty sure that's grown-up Lindsay Wallace, the little girl who survives the first movie. Anyway, back on topic, when Michael scares Jamie in the costume area, she screams, and Rachel comes running and just intentionally knocks over the sticker display. Why does she do that? I mean, look at this, play it back. You just see her clearly go out of her way to knock this thing over. It's very reminiscent of this beautiful moment. And then why do they not just look right across the store and see Michael? This whole scene makes no sense. I mean, I know I already massacred our good old Illinois boys, but I think Rachel is maybe also not the smartest. It's metal! God damn it, it's metal! What does that mean? You don't know what metal is? You know, like solid material, strong, shiny, conducts electricity. <sighs> There's no hope for you, is there? Anyway, I think that's just about it for Halloween 4, unless you have anything to add. There is this one part where when Rachel is at Chief Meeker's house, she comes downstairs to talk to Deputy Logan. And if you look in the background, Michael pops his head out. You might've missed that, so we'll tack it on there, just in case. Next time, we'll move on to Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, a somehow even more generic title. You see, life after Halloween 4 wasn't exactly smooth sailing. We're four videos into this Halloween collaboration, so if you haven't subscribed to Jimmy yet, I don't even know what you're doing. For my full collection of Halloween analyses, click that playlist on the left. And if you love all things Halloween, make sure you subscribe to CZ's World. I've got new horrors every week, so ring the death bell and select all notifications, and I will see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.